Okay, let me see if you Mark. Hey, Mark. Mary. Mark. I'm wondering if that's Mark Hewitt, because he told me he wasn't going to make it, but maybe let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Thank you, Christina. I'm I'm here. This is Mark. Hey, Mark. Hi. Go okay. waiting on Jay. Okay. And and Ben. Four oh one, but I'd like to give Jake another minute or two unless anybody's opposed. All right. Well, why don't we go ahead, unless anybody is objects, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, um, I'm sorry, Jake's presentation is a little further down in the agenda. Um, and so I'd like to go ahead and get started. So, Ben, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off with a uh, an update on Anacapa Canyon, that'd be great. Sure. I hope everybody's doing well. Finally got this video working. Um, Anacapa Canyon, so construction continues at Anacapa Canyon, and as, as everybody's well aware, um, things are progressing according to schedule. We anticipate having the main clubhouse um, complete by end of August, um, and then ultimately moving our pre-leasing operations up there. Um, the website continues to remain available for any related inquiries, both in terms of sales and or rentals. Um, so I would encourage people to uh, to view the website and fill out the fill form for any related information. Um, in terms of sales, uh, there as well, um, things are progressing on the timeline as planned. They are going to be opening kind of uh, pre-sales leasing or excuse me, pre-sale trailer and related efforts. Um, I think they're starting to launch some information in mid to late July. Um, and so further information to come in that respect. And again, we'll continue to populate the Anacapa Canyon website um, with more updates and any information that we can push out by way of Jake, we're happy to do so. Um, if there are any questions, you know, we do have the email uh, address available, or again, you can certainly route any related inquiries either to me directly, um, bgordon at kennedywilson.com, or by way of Jake in the CAM office, and he can get it over to me and happy to respond in kind. So much, Ben. Does anybody have any questions for Ben? So, Ben, can you remind me? So I'm almost in summer mode where my faculty brain has kind of shut down and I'm getting on with the rest of my life here. Um, <laughs> Are the are the first sale homes are the university employees and in, in, um, prioritized in any way for there these is, units? Yeah, there is a similar priority system for university related faculty and staff. Is um, there information about that? Because I know we have a lot of new faculty that are joining coming here in yeah. the fall and in next year. Ben, I don't know if you had a chance to talk to Nick Long recently, but there was a slight change here. So, Teeny. It, it, the priority system does exist. And so the home is sold to the person in the highest category who places the highest offer. And so it's and the counter offers sorry. are allowed. Can you, can you repeat that? I'm sorry, my phone, my earphones went dead. Yeah, so it, it, the, the priority system does exist in, in the Catholic Canyon. And so the homes are going to be sold to the person in the highest category who places the highest offer for a property. But it's possible that somebody could place an offer. Um, you know, let's say the home is sold for seven hundred thousand dollars, and one person who's a 
uh, category two, place an offer for let's say 650 and another person placed it with general public for 675, the 675 would be the successful offer, even though there's there are lower category. We're, we're working out something to, to, I think this is going to work out. I've got to get it through the lawyers to limit the number of counter offers only when it's sold initially from Comstock and only for CI people, so category two and three. But it's important to know that um, you know, a house could theoretically be sold above asking price too. Obviously, Comstock's not in the business of underpricing their products, but that's theoretically possible. Okay, so there's really no priority then if somebody can be outbid. Well, what currently we, we, we're working it out with with Comstock and with KW. We're trying to limit the number of counter offers for categories two and three to two counter offers. So, let's say it's um, say it's Ben and you, and the house is seven hundred thousand dollars, and Ben offers six seventy five, and you offer six fifty. You'd be invited to match Ben's six seventy five offer. Ben could come back and say. 695, you'd be off, uh, invited to match Ben's 695 offer. That would be the second counter offer, and that'd be the end of it. Okay. So that's, that's, that's what it is. That's what it is. It's, but it's no longer affordable housing for CI. No, it's employees. market rate. Correct. Yeah. It's market okay. rate. Yeah. Yeah. It's a yeah. Different structure. Thank you. Anybody have any other questions for Ben? Yes, uh, Mary said no. Okay, um, I'll go up. Um, uh, Mary, do you have a question? I don't want to cut I think you off. Mary does have a question. Yeah, I do have a okay. question for Ben. I'm sorry. Um, stepping away from Anacapa Canyon for a moment, do we have any progress on the grocery? Uh, we do have some progress on the grocery. Uh, this related to obviously the town center. So the progress is steady, uh, but nothing definitive yet. Um, you know, it's not of our making. The lease has been with the proposed occupant of the space for some time now. We got comments from his legal counsel. We've responded to all of those comments. We've sent the lease form back to him. He's received it. His attorney is reviewing it. We are waiting additional red line comments. So we do not, we have the construct of a deal with this prospect. We do not have a lease signed at this time though. Do you have a cutoff date for them? Uh, do I have a cutoff date? Yeah, like, you know, put up or shut up. Uh, you know, if we had a number of other prospective markets lining up behind them, we would be more aggressive in that posture, Mary. But unfortunately, we continue to advertise the space. We do not have any other interested parties. So while we are doing our best to bring this deal to fruition, um, you know, our our options are somewhat limited at this time. Yeah. And so, you know, we are as eager as you are both to bring a tenant to the community and to bring a paying tenant to the town center. Um, so our our interests are certainly aligned. We would have liked to have this done, you know, many moons ago, but we are in the state where we're in. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm also concerned about the um, the loss of the sales tax revenue. You know, we're three years without that sales tax revenue. And, you know, that might pay a few bills. Okay. But I mean, your your answer is what it is. I understand. Yeah, we're doing what we can. Okay. Thank you. Um, and, and, and I don't know, John, if this is properly directed to Ben, but he, he's the, the closest thing after you. So I'll, I'll give an attaboy. Um, we had gotten a complaint last week from a resident who reported that he'd been you know, picking up garbage around the area of the construction site, and he was quite distressed about it. And uh, he reported back to me the following day after I asked that it be addressed that there had been improvement, and we appreciate that. Glad to hear. Yeah, I, I I appreciate that. Ben, Sean, and Terry, and uh, is I can't what's in his name. Is it PJ who's with McCarthy? PJ, yes. And PJ jumped right on it. So thanks to that team for for being so responsive to the community. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was noticed and it was appreciated. Great. All right. Um, I think it's my turn. So for the site authority, um, the water rate study is finalized. It's been posted to the website along with 
the presentation that was given by Black and Beach, and the community was invited to submit questions that were then posed to Black and Beach. That Q&A is also posted to the website. Um, and then there was a, I don't know, I doubt many people watched the site authority board meeting back on May 15th, but we gave a pretty lengthy presentation on reserves. I would encourage anybody who has any questions about the sort of the history of reserves, how they work, what they're for, to watch the presentation. I think it's quite informative. And in, in the agenda, I have an Anacapa Canyon construction update, which I'm gonna skip because Ben gave a, a more complete um, update anyway. And so with that, I'll take any questions. I was waiting for that construction update. Can I, one thing before my question point of order, did we skip Mary's update from the HAC? Oh, geez, Louise, I am so bad at this. Oh, so, Mary, sorry. So, and then I want to come back to the, to the construction update, if you don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. Mary, do you want, do you want to flip you and me and we can do the construction um, update or do you want to? Yeah, you, you go ahead. Cause I've got okay. you know, half a dozen items and they're, okay. they're tick sheet items. So go ahead. Okay. Uh, can you go ahead? Okay, thank you. So, so I'm looking at the agenda in item D, is it 3D? And the number three, the for sale home town homes. And I asked this question last time and it doesn't look like it got updated, but it looks like there's a total of only 11 single family homes being built, especially with item C uh, that says phase three remaining 84 town homes. It doesn't yeah, address single family homes. No, so I asked about right. that it's... last time. You're you're 100 right. It's um, it's Ben, help me out here. It's 109 single if, family. Yes, and then how many townhomes? Uh, it's 109 combination of single family and townhomes. Do you remember uh, what the breakdown is? Uh, you know, I can pull it. It's it's about 60 percent townhomes. Um, let me pull it. Bear with me here. With that, with that said, the initial phase of construction, uh, Jeannie, is, you know, eight units. It's there, yeah. two model homes and a block of six townhomes. Um, mm -hmm. The lots are being taken down in phases over time by our for sale development partner. Mm -hmm. um, and they've taken 25 lots so far, and they will continue to take lots, um, you know, handful every quarter as they continue to deliver over time. And I know that there have been a lot of questions related to pricing. We are getting very close to being able to kind of to publicize the pricing. We've been working in close concert with John and his team to kind of finalize and formalize the go forward CAM budget um, and some of the related costs, which will also inform the pricing um, that the units will be launched at. So that's to come in the next few weeks. So we'll keep you guys all posted is that. Yeah. I think my, my question just continues to be how many single family homes will there be in total? So, okay. so far, to, I only see 11 on the list. Coming to so. you in just a moment. In Thank the meantime, you. I encourage you guys to further the dialogue. Thank you. I'll eventually get that fixed, Jeannie. I know that this is strike two and I don't want to get out. It's two. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> All right, um, any other questions from me? Yeah, um, about the water reserves, John? The water, res the water rate study? Or, well, the amount for the water reserves is, is okay. part of the whole big water picture. Um, yeah. In the budget, I believe it shows as something slightly over $92,000. I, I, I don't remember it, I, I direct you to CI facilities, who is the water rate provider, but are you talking about the the reserve amount that's going to be built up over time to cover Uglen operating and maintenance? Uh, let me, I'm looking here because you gave a number yesterday in your response to the... Oh, I have the response letter here. Hold on, I can pull okay. that up. Oh, here we go. Okay, I'm looking at that bullet okay. point there with the water rate study. Page two. The one where it says it ends with $87,000? Yep. Okay. Okay, based on the rate structure proposed, University Glen pays a 47% share, which would equal about $87,000. Um, okay. But 
Um, a community member brought it to my attention today that the budget shows $92,000 and change. And I'm just trying to nail that down. I, I would, I, 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 I'll try to get an, I will get an answer from facilities. That's not something that the site authority is, you know, is calculating. It's really just the CI facilities acts as the water utility, essentially provider for University of Glen because there's no other option. We've, We've explored, just so everybody knows, we've explored the idea of having Cam Rosa provide All I'm trying water. to do is square the numbers, John. May, may I make sure a comment? Is I, may I make yeah, a comment? Please. Yeah. Um, be aware that the budget number, which is the $92,531, was given to us about the 1st of April. Mm -hmm. and oh, that but that's was, the operating cost for a year, right? Right. Well, and that was that was what we thought it was yeah. going to be. No, and two, now, two different things here. Go ahead. We're talking about two different numbers. Eighty-seven thousand dollars is forty-seven percent of ninety days of operating cost. I've learned that the the way utility providers operate is they try to make sure that they have ninety days worth of operating costs on hand in cash, and that's the hundred eighty-five thousand dollar number that you referenced, Mary. Forty-seven percent of that is the eighty-seven thousand dollars. So that's once the reserves are fully built up. But it's not just the, the rate, the rate, the water rate fee covers operating plus reserves. And so I believe the the 90 something, the $92,000 number is the annual cost of all of it together, building up reserves and operating. But there, the, the, a portion of the $92,000 goes towards eventually building up to $87,000 in reserve for you, Glenn. And the remainder is the other. I think there's 12 customers for the campus. It's, you know, Carden School and UAS and U Glen and housing, and they'll collectively build up $187,000 in reserves to cover those operating costs. Does that explain it? Okay, but those now make the distinction for me between infrastructure reserves and reserves to cover operating costs, because I'm hearing two different things. I don't like to use the word infrastructure because it implies that there's something other than water stuff there, like sidewalks and roads. And so no, well, I'm, talking, I'm talking about, you know, the mains and stuff. Yeah, that's but just yeah. but isolating it just in terms of what's required to deliver water and sewer to the community. Right. So that has operating costs, which is, um, you know, annual sort of like something breaks and they don't pay for it out of reserves. It's a, you know, I don't know what, a valve breaks or a meter breaks. They don't pull that out of the reserves. They pull that out of operating cost. Um, I know a small portion of Roxanne, uh, her salary is considered operating cost. And I'd have to dig into the water rate study to get all of them. But again, there's, there's a, a, I don't know how much of that $92,000 in cost goes towards building up reserve. But it's a lot like the CAM budget in that there's, operating costs and there's reserves that are being built up over time, the water rate study seeks to do the same thing. I, I'm not trying to avoid your question. If yeah. you have follow-up, I'm happy to answer. No, okay, so so you're saying that those two numbers are independent of one another. They're, they're interrelated in that one is seeking to build up the other, but one, they are they are different numbers not by mistake, they are different numbers because one is the cost this year, the $87,000 is the goal for building up a reserve to for University of Glen in isolation. Okay. And then if I may just circle back to Jeannie's question. Um, so number of single family homes is gonna be 45 single family homes, okay. 64 townhomes for the Thank 100 you nine total units. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 11 Mary, seemed like why bother. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, did you have any other questions for me? Um, not, no, not that, not for here. Okay. Okay. Jeannie, I, I saw your, your note in chat. I thought you wanted that taken out of the agenda and you said, Something to the effect of I'll just bring it up when we were going back and forth on email no, yesterday. 
I said I'd save my questions for the meeting, oh, I, but thank you. I thought you, you meant strike that. the thing. So, no, yeah. I'm saving my questions. You. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we can talk about that whenever you want. Um, I'm, whatever order the agenda is on, I'm fine if we save that. Okay. Um, we didn't have you in the agenda, so why don't we go ahead and talk about it now? It's my section. I think your question is directed at me, I suspect. Um, I, I don't know who it's directed to, so thank okay. you. <laughs> um, so I received the notice right this week um, about the increases. And I, for me, I'm just concerned a little bit about the timeline for notification for people to be making these changes. Um, we're giving them less than two weeks by the times the letters that were received um, to make those kind of changes in their billing or things like that. You know, May 15th, the site authority approved the increases. June 12th is when the letter was dated. It wasn't postmarked until the 16th. I didn't get it until the 20th, which leaves me 10 days to make those changes, which is less than two weeks. And we're asking for people to make changes that, and I guess the town homeowners actually are much more significant amount um, dollar wise than single family homeowners. And I'm wondering if, if we can do something to adjust that to give people a bit more notice than at least two weeks um, and not from the data of the letter, but from the postmark is really is when the letter goes out. So just, just as a consideration, because I know that these are really big increases for a lot of people. Um, not everybody stays up to date on all of the changes that are happening with the site authority decisions. And so just trying to put in place um, more communication parameters or at least timelines for these kinds of changes that go in effect. Thank you. Speak to that. One of the things that the past has told us, you know, the 10th of the month is when the amounts are, the CAM fees are due. And we really do not want to send it out before the 10th. That's why it's dated the 12th. And we, in the midst of all this, we, we had several mailings this year, including the elections that we also did. And so um, we did it as quickly as we could and as effectively as we could with the, with the time and how it fell during the week to to get them out. And I appreciate that. Um, in the past, we've tried to do it earlier. And then we spend all of our time in June telling people what, what amount to pay on the 10th of June. You know, do they send the new one? Do they send the old one? And so um, based on experience, we, we um, really do not want to send it out much earlier. I know it sounds short notice, you know, and for those that are doing the, um, the um, automatic payments, I think your point would be well taken. Most of the people that do checks, I don't think that it, may, it affects them particularly. Well, planning wise for the money, it might affect them. Yeah, because could I suggest that because this year represents such a significant bump, particularly for the town homeowners, that um, we might look at you know, not hitting people with late fees on the difference for July or uh, some adjustment. We usually do that. that we needs. usually do that anyway. Usually we yeah. do it for, for kind of for the first for the qu first quarter because basically we do we don't send out late fees if it if it is less than one month's um, maintenance rent. So you know, it's like if it's a hundred dollars, we aren't sending out a late fee. Um, if it goes over the 484, that then at that point is when they would get a notification. And I wouldn't anticipate that ha happening really for the first quarter if, the, you know, the difference between the um, the, three, the 387 and it's almost $100 and the 484, you know, so it, it if they make their payment of this year's amount, it would not show up as a, it would not tickle our file until it is over the 484. Mm -hmm. And so that would, there would be, there is time. We're very cognizant of that, Jeannie, you know, that, that we, we do not go out. Our intention isn't to collect late fees. Our intention is to get people current. And so we'll work with people on that. I think that's, um, your point's well taken. It's kind of in our way of doing business that it's going to, if it is, if if the amount is below the monthly rate, the monthly amount is that it doesn't, we don't um, charge late fees for that. Okay, yeah, thank you. I just brought yeah. that up because I don't check my mail all the time either. Yeah. I'm sure there's I, other I people who that. don't make it to the mailbox all the time, so. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, let me ask you something, Jeannie. Do you have any other, well, the mailbox we do because per the ground sublease, it needs to be a mailed notification as opposed to a email. And of course, with the emails, um, if you have any other ways, maybe we send out a separate reminder, you know, around the first of the, do an email separate from the e-blast with, you know, something that just, maybe we can email the letter itself again and say, you know, just as a reminder. Be on the lookout for this in your yeah. mail. Well, I think it's like that you may or may not have gotten it, you know, or you may have mm-hmm. thought, I didn't know what this was. But, you know, effective July 1, maybe we send it, you know, before before the holiday weekend, you know, a couple of days mm-hmm. and say, here it is, you know, you got this in the mail per the ground sublease, but here it is, you know, most of us have emails now and that's what we check and and we can do that. And we could conceivably even add an urgent onto it, you know, yeah. so, that, so that that would work. Yeah, I would think even, even in an e-blast, say, be on the lookout for your rate change. Yeah. Right. Just something that notifies them that this is coming. I'd love to hear the HAC weigh in on this because Ben's keenly aware he's part of the whole process. So he can he makes sure that he's covering, you know, apartment uh, dwellers and town center. But Mary, if if the HAC wants to inform the homeowners in a different way, um, I'd love to hear their thoughts. I will raise it tonight. Thank you Any for including questions? that. I appreciate it. Yeah, Thank you. No problem. Anytime. Any other questions for me before we hand it over to Jake? All right, Jake, you're up. Okay. Um, wanted to to mention um, we did talk about the budget just now and um, those amounts. The sen- the single family homeowners rates as of July one goes up to three hundred thirteen dollars and eighty six cents, and the townhomes are at four eighty four. 76 um Ben's his apartments the um the Mission Hills apartments are at 27163 the town center apartments are at 27771 and the town center retail are at 27771 as well next item um this month we did have the election for the HAC I thought maybe Mary you would say something about that but that um basically um we had had um three um, openings, positions, vacancies, and three candidates. And the candidates um, who were successful were um, Sandra Bolger, Andrew Morris, and Sasha Strunk. Um, Their two-year terms will begin on July 1, 2023. And we um, thank our retiring HAC members, Tom Bocart, Carolyn Phillips, and Sandy Boyd, for their service to University Glen by um, participating on the HAC. The next item, um, there was conversation at the last HAC meeting and also at the a recent budget advisory group meeting regarding um, UGCAM's um, request for repairs to the um, DG paths, which due to the um, excessive rains this year, which really didn't stop until May, end of May, that um, there was a lot of gullies um, that are really trip hazards. And we got pricing from Gothic, who is our um, landscape maintenance um, vendor um, to do the repairs. And our initial quote was $40,000. And we made some modifications and limited the area to get the the amount um, for six locations um, to $24,935. And um, following the HAC meetings last last month, um, John and the bag um, reviewed this and wanted to have a conversation about that. And unanimously from the members of the the bag, um, it was recommended that we move forward with this, um, the repairs to the, the common area trails repair is the line item that is offered number it's in parentheses this is the um, reserve category number 1802 um, in the 2022-23 budget advisory or budget um, line item under reserves and so um, the budget for 2022-23 had a budget of $25,000, so we're below that, so we're within budget. 
And um, John um, sent me authorization today after getting um, our final authorization from Ben. So that will move forward and will be um, considered part of this fiscal year. Next item, we also received uh, recently approval from the site authority. There are trip hazards having to do with the sidewalks, the concrete sidewalks. And um, we do this kind of every other year. Um, in the budget, there's a line item for $20,000, um, which is concrete repair, replace, trip hazard, and it's category um, 403 in the common area reserve study. And um, we had some concerns about specific locations and we talked with Precision Concrete Cutting, who is our vendor um, that we have used in the past. And this year, we're this spring, um, we're going to do $2,216.50 worth of work to bring in the worst, um, to address the worst locations throughout the community. And that will be part of this year's budget as well. Um, on another item, um, in the, at, in the um, common area reserve study, it also mentioned um, that we are up for um, re resurfacing the basketball court in the community park. And I had put that together and during the discussion, I'm sorry, I wasn't there. I had personal obligations out of, out of state at the, at the May um, HAC meeting. There was quite a bit of conversation about that and particularly in, with regard to the, the pickleball court and the striping of that. And um, I'm gonna bring up tonight that um, I'm, I'm suggesting that um, we have a working group with the HAC um, that talks about the, the striping and what that would look like and what would be the best way to do that. I know there are various people in the community that have strong opinions about that and that that way we could move forward. The um, what I wanted to mention was that right now the I have two pricings for the project, um, and they are between fifteen thousand three hundred dollars and sixteen thousand eight hundred dollars, and the amount that is listed in the common area reserve um, budget for re, um, common common area basketball court resurfacing. Um, Reserve study category number 1206 is $20,578. So either of those are within budget, but um, cross RTs and dot RIs and, and get that, that completed. If that doesn't get completed um, during this budget year, um, we'll carry it over into next budget year and get it done as soon as possible. There was also some question about um, pickleball nets. And at the present time, the people who we are not purchasing any pickleball nets, it's really up to the people who are using the, using the court to do that. So that's kind of an update where we are there as far as moving that forward. Um, next item, um, most of this has to do with landscaping. Um, the landscaping, the landscaping Gothic completed the state mandatory mandated 100 foot brush clearance um, at the perimeter of UG by the deadline of June 1, 2023. Um, I have checked on um, the Ventura County Fire Prevention website. I have not seen the verification and the certify certifications, certif certif yeah, certif certificates, the certificates <laughs> that, that verify that. Um, I have not seen them. We'll, we'll watch for them. And then as soon as we get them, I was looking at the website and last year, the letter with all the support, supporting information for the June 1st date was dated August 1st. So, um, so we'll put that together so that people have, have a letter from the site authority along with the insurances that, that we, we have for, for the common area in that or the, the university has for the common areas. And then um, along with the cert certificates and the parcel maps as well. So that's, that's coming up as well. The other thing that, ha that has come up is that um, it had come up in regard to the 100 foot clearance that in talking with uh, Larry Williams of Ventura County that the owners are responsible up to their property lines. And then anything beyond that to the 100 foot line is responsible of the 
as the responsibility of the owner beyond the property line. And John has been in that discussion and we talked about that. And John is working with um, facility services to develop a map of the 100 foot clearance and then overlay where the property lines are. And at that point, I will get with Gothic to determine how much of their budgeted portion um, would really be considered beyond the property lines and the responsibility of the university and side authority to the 100 foot property or the 100 foot um, boundary, mandated boundary. And so that is that is forthcoming. And my understanding is that we would be reimbursed. It may end up that it, it may end up in the reconciliation, you know, at the end of September, but that we're watching that um, for everybody's information, Gothic's line item for brush clearance in their contract is for $12,702.90. So if there's a percentage of that, that gives you an idea. It's, you know, you know, it could it could easily be you know, it isn't, it's going to be in the tens of the, the tens or the thousands. It isn't going to be in the tens of thousands. So and, and just one, mm -hmm. yeah, the site authority will fulfill that obligation. But one point of clarification is a hundred feet from a structure, not from a property line. So like the, the right. far boundary of CI Park doesn't apply, Channel Islands does. Right. So, yeah, thanks, John. Okay, um, the next thing, um, wanted to bring up that we are aware that on the 15th, um, there was a trailer from the, um, from the construction that um, ro rolled over the planter on Anacapa at um, Channel Islands. And I've sent that over to, to John. Um, it, it looked pretty bad. I, I'm gonna talk to, I'm talking with Gothic about whether it needs to be replaced or whether it will grow back. I'm not exactly sure. So we'll get additional yeah. information on that. Yeah, and before you go too far, they're, they're super responsive. So I, I, we want to give them a chance to, if they choose to repair it themselves, that's fine with me as long as it gets fixed. So let me send it over to, um, you know, McCarthy and, uh, and KW and Acapa Canyon. And my guess is that they'll jump right on it or, or agree well, that Gothic does the work and they'll pay you back. Right. And seeing that Gothic's kind of at both places, I think they can figure that out. Okay. Yeah, I think so too. Okay. Um, next item, um, over in the community park this month, there was spraying of the broadleaf plants, which is basically clover in the turf. And that was completed by Gothic um, around the middle of the month. And um, wanted to emphasize that no herbicide was sprayed in the dog park or within 100 or within 10 feet of the community garden. So um, they did a good job on that and took care of that. That was done over a series of about six days and um, over the weekend. So that's one. Um, we are aware that we, um, UGCAM continues to receive complaints regarding Gothic using blowers throughout UG and um, Gothic, um, we've notified Gothic about that and they continue to talk to their, their team about that. Um, in conversation with several um, owners um, in the community, a, particularly, a particular concern are the street gutters and the potential damage of blowing debris um, under the parked cars, particularly along the street. And in discussion with Gothic, it was determined one potentially satisfying method to address the debris in the street gutters is to have the cars not park on the streets, for a designated day of the week for Gothic to use their walk behind vacuum to pick up the debris in the gutters, particularly when they're doing the, um, the, um, the mowing. And so um, what, what I am suggesting, and I'll bring up to the HAC tonight for consideration, is that on Mondays, that no, no cars park on the streets between 8 a.m. and 3 p.m at the 100-400 block of Channel Islands, all of Landing Cove, Anacapa Drive, and Anacapa Drive. So that would kind of take care of everything south of the vehicular, um, vehicular bridge. And then on Tuesdays is when they mow north of the vehicular bridge, and there would be no parking of cars between 8 a.m. and 3 p.m. on Channel Islands Drive, 700 to, 700 to 2000 block of Channel Islands, Kyler Harbor Drive, Fry's Harbor Drive, East Plast Harbors Drive, um, 
Twin Harbor Drive and Santa Cruz Island Drive. And so I, uh, in talking with Gothic, Gothic would agree that, that initially they would post signs you know, with stakes saying, this is what it is. And we'd, we'd roll it out and bring it to people's attention. Um, and, and I would suggest that maybe the first Monday we, we start doing this is maybe the, um, the week of July 10th after the holidays. And, and that's, that's for the consideration. Um, if, if people have other suggestions, um, I know that the ground sublease allows for um, notification and to not park on streets. Um, for street cleaning, basically. And I think this would be a sufficient, a um, effective way of doing it. And it would also limit damage to cars and um, that kind of item. Yes, Jeannie. So the only thing that concerns me is that we're in the peak of summer and people go on vacations Mm -hmm. for weeks at a time and may not have the ability to move their car if they're not notified ahead of time or give the keys to a neighbor to move their car, Mm -hmm. it might be nice to have alternate parking locations also listed when some of these streets aren't clear. Like I'm home all day long. I I mean, I I work, I'm at home now. I mean, I park in my garage, but um, I know other people do park on the street and they work at home. So maybe even having alternate, you know, can they go down and park at the town center on those days in the student housing lot? right? That is virtually empty or just having alternatives, I think, for people um, to try to find and just mitigate some of those people who, who are home all day. Right. Right. I think the other, the other thing is that this would be kind of ongoing. So it might solve it for the summer, but it doesn't necessarily solve it for, for right. when students here. I'm, I'm not saying it's perfect, you know, um, yeah. but it's like I uh, wanted to put this in front of the HAC tonight, Mary, so you're aware of it, mm-hmm. that and say, you know, is this, you know, it may be that we do do it every other week, too. You know, it's like that we do streets every other week so you can park on the, the, the street over one week and then it does it. You know, I'm not it isn't all all decided yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And forgive me, Jake, I think I'm a degree removed here. The underlying complaint is related to blowers because because they're blowing debris and it's because the cars aren't moved, the cars are are at the streets. And so they blow and it's like they blow all over the place because they can't get under the car and they, you know, they, they can't really contain it. It blows it up and over the cars and people are concerned about their cars that they're parking on the street being damaged. To date, I am not aware of cars being damaged. No one has come with me with a complaint. But it looks very dramatic when they're when they're blowing and it's dust all over the place, you know, with leaves and and um, sand and that kind of thing that that comes off of the down the the street gutters. And are there any incremental costs from this alternate kind of pickup methodology? No, because that basically it is in their contract to keep the streets clean. And, you know, so when I when I approach them about it, they go, yeah. Could we, can we figure out a way to use our vacuum? That's where they were coming, you know? And so that's, that's where we are right now. And I think there is, I think there, there would be a way to do it, you know, as, because, because when, when people, people like the fact that the streets look clean and it's like that if cars are parked there, that then you, and there may be a couple of them, I'm thinking particularly on Santa Cruz Island Drive, that if there are cars parked along there and it's wet, you really never get it, get it cleaned up unless the cars move. And so that's, that's kind of where it is. And I think we, we can discuss, you know, kind of a schedule alternate alternating streets too. That may be the, that may be the solution, Jeannie, you know? Yeah. And um, so I appreciate it. Yes. Mark. What about just parking on the other side of the street one day a week? Well, on Anacapa, that that may you mean do odd and even, odd, uh-huh. and, odd and even might work for Landing Cove, Anacapa, and Smugglers, but you know it's a fire lane on, um, on all of the other ones on on Fries and and Twin and Platts and Kyler. So you know, I'm not sure the fire department would be too interested in us parking across on the opposite side of the street when it's a fire lane but we can talk about that. Yeah. Is it really a fire lane? Yeah. It says do not, it's, it says no parking fire. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They're red signs. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, um, UG CAM continues to work with the site authority and police department on developing the safety day in the near future. It's, you know, be aware that um, there is there is information on the um, evacuation plans that is um, being updated and put on the website as well, and we'll mention it again at the HEC. So we've done that. Okay, um, Gothic continues to respond to irrigation lakes. Appreciate everybody's um, bringing bringing the documentation. The pictures are really helpful, and we get them taken care of as soon as we can. Um, there has been some question about the geyser that was um, along Channel Islands that was right um, to the south side of the uh, vehicular bridge, the purple um, cover that got dented. Um, that was something that um, was an incident with Gothic and um, took us a little bit of time to figure out whose jurisdiction it was. Gothic could repair it but it ended up that the repair was on the pipe that needed to be shut off by the university. And it's really infrastructure from the university. So um, we have the pipe now repaired and the university has, has ordered the purple, a new purple cover and that all of that will be um, charged to Gothic and they will cover those expenses. Um, Gothic, um, in conversation with Gothic, they have gone ahead and have worked on um, lifting the lower limbs along all the trees on the sidewalk so that we have eight feet of clearance. Um, and that is particularly along, well, particularly on Anacapa, it's pretty significant. And along all the others um, on the north side, phase 1C as well. And um, that that has the... Um, Australian Christmas trees that um, bend down pretty pretty dramatically. And with all the water that we've had this spring, um, they're growing a lot, so lifted that, okay. Um, just, just for everybody to know, as part of the, the budget process, there was a line item that was added to, to um, get a, a line item for water to the um, amenity pool houses. And right now that would be considered divided by the common area. And because it isn't metered, that would mean now that the single families and townhomes may pay part of that or most of that. And so I've been in communication with um, the facility services and they, they agreed that the metering of the pools would be an expense that um, is not part of the infrastructure that is part of the water study. Um, but would be an additional charge. They're saying that the university are the ones that need to do the work because they're responsible for it. And that they would charge us, the fee that they gave me was $12,900. And just wanted to put that on everybody's radar because as of the 1st of July, there is a line item for meter, meter charges to the, the water serving the pool houses based on what the meters read. And right now we don't have meters there. And so um, I had suggested, was that something that we as the CAM manager together with the owner of the amenities, which is multifamily, um, is that something we could do? And as of now, the university would say, no, that's something they have to do. So we may talk, uh, just wanted to bring that to people's attention. And um, then I'm, would like your idea on that kind of as a sidebar, seeing this is the first that you've heard that information. Um, the water rate study and questions um, from UGCAM owners have been placed, posted on the website. I think that is pretty much, that's everything that I had. Did, are there any questions? Okay. Thank you, Jake. I appreciate that. Well, if there's any go-backs, we can address those. And if not, then we've reached the end of the agenda. No, we haven't. Mary hasn't <laughs> gone yet. <laughs> oh, geez. No, we haven't. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Mary, you're up. First, I'm going to double back to pickleball because uh, Jake's comments reminded me that we have uh, an unresolved pickleball question. I know that the last time that we were here, John, you told us that the community was um, 
not permitted to use the on-campus pickleball courts. And the request is that you, um, you know, in your role as liaison between us and, and the university, um, repeat that ask and explain why and explain that we're, you know, awaiting a, a resolution of the resurfacing, but it's the summertime, no, you know, they're not in use. Um, and Students don't use them. Yeah, students don't use them. And when we talk about, you know, um, building alliances between the university and, and the community, this, this is really low hanging fruit. I, I can ask them again. I know that during the summer, the housing is occupied by conference clients, and it could be that there's a concern about those were offered up to conferencing clients and they might not be available, but I can ask the question one more time. Okay, thank you. I'd appreciate that. Um, the, um, uh, ben, I, yeah, like um, your assistance with this as well, we got notice yesterday or the day before that the library is doing an event next Thursday um, in in the courtyard behind the library. Is that right, Jeannie, where it's going to be? Um, I don't know, but it's Dulham Courtyard is the courtyard behind the library. Okay. And they are, um, well, and I think it's a wine and cheese event and who doesn't love wine and cheese events. So we're hoping that there will be community support and people going out to it. But I'd like to make sure that um, De Paula has that and that it gets out to the apartment dwellers as well. So that it is, you know, so that the invitation I don't think was intended to be limited to the homeowners. And we want to make sure that everybody who was intended to be invited is. Appreciate that. Yeah. If you could please forward any invitation or related information and I'll make sure that we push it out. Okay, super. Thank you. Um, um, okay, John, um, you, you did mention, um, the fact that there was a, an email that went out, um, with a writing in response to the, um, uh, the many comments to the site authority prior to the May meeting, the email didn't go out over letterhead and it was unsigned. So we don't know who's who officially that's from. It's from site authority staff who crafted the letter on behalf of the site authority board. Okay. And so, um, so the board approved it before it went out. Uh, legal counsel did uh, the, the board doesn't vote on letters sort of, you know, day to day matters. Their oversight is higher level than that. But um you know, high level staff, legal counsel, there was a lot of people involved in that response. Okay, in the future, you know, we'd appreciate communications of that nature being on letterhead being dated and with some indication of authorship, just because for record keeping purposes, you know, when you wanna go back to something, you wanna be able to say what it was and when. Mm -hmm. I have a lot Fair of enough. letters from University Glen that I have no timeline that I can put to it. I have a whole stack no, of files and we just don't know when it, when they were dated. So I think that's totally fair criticism. Yeah. Chris, Christina. Yeah. I updated that today and I got it signed on letterhead and I sent it to Jake just today. So we can, can we update the one that's, yeah. Could we update the one that's posted to the website? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll do that replace one PDF for the other place. Okay. Uh, that's fair criticism. Mary and Jeannie. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Um, and also, at the same time, John, you sent me. Um, oh, by the way, how many uh, how many comments did the uh, site authority receive prior to their May meeting? Do you know? Not exactly. That letter was signed by a lot of people. I think it was. Um, it was signed by thirty eight people. It was thirty eight. Yeah, the letter was signed years. by twenty four people. The letter that you sent to me prior to it the was, board meeting in May. The well, I I sent an updated one to Christina right before the day of the site authority meeting because we had additional signatories come along. So if you may be looking at something older, I think the final product had thirty eight signatures representing twenty six um, homeowning units. Uh, the one I the last one I saw was 
uh, 24 owners and 15 households, but it sounds like there was additional signatories after the letter, after yeah. the copy I got. Okay. Um, in any event, um, that and in addition to whatever other correspondence the site authority got, we're just curious as to um, there was what one. I there was one. There was one really thoughtfully crafted email that came individually. Uh, it was directed to President Yao on be like and directed to the board through President Yao, and those the questions that that homeowner raised were also answered in the letter. Okay. All right. Did so I think I was a signatory on one of the letters. I never got a response. You, you might have been. I don't know how we have this. This because Mayor, you're the one who sent me with one with the 24 and 15. So it sounds like there was another, uh, another, you know, a, a letter that came with additional signatories. Uh, I'm not sure. I I don't think I saw that. But I I, I can I, I did the. Let me ask you this, Mary. Did the did the questions posed and concerns posed change or just the number of people who signed it? Uh, just the number of signatories at, at the end. How about we do this? And could we, we, we're, we're going to send it. I was going to bring it up tonight and then just send it out. Jake is going to send it out in an e-blast. So I, I want to make sure that everybody who, who signed it gets a response. I don't want to be evasive in some way, but I think we're going to get it to everybody. Christina? I have the one that she's talking about, the one that has all 23 or 24 um, signatures. I, I, I have I, the one with 24. Oh, okay. Okay. But Mary, well, let me go dig up, Christina, that oh. you may be missing a page. If you send yeah. me those additional signatures, Mary, I yeah. can work on getting the email addresses and directing the responses okay. to those individuals. And then, like I said, Jake is going to send it out as a e blast to the entire community, um, I think at the next regularly scheduled e-blast. Okay. Um, and then a attached to your communication, John, was the bag charter. Uh, that was that was sent to you because you had some you had some okay. follow-up questions to me directly uh, mm -hmm. to Tuesday, I believe it was. Um, Whatever but no, I did not send yeah, I didn't send those to everybody because it was just an email you wrote me and okay. I'm not I mean, I'm, I don't have any secrets, but I don't want to share private correspondence unless I have your permission. Okay, so. it's okay. Yeah, the bag uh, charter was there. Yeah. What, do we know what the date of that bag charter is? Uh, let me pull it up. Because it's not, what you sent me is not dated. Then I'm not certain. Okay. Um, and it, as I read it, and I, you know, I've, I've read these things before, but you read them and then you read them. Um, it references an entity or entities, which may be news to me. Um, okay. University Glen Community Advisory Group is that's that's the meeting that we're in right now. Okay, so that's just the CAG. Okay. Right. Um, and then it says University Glenn Common Area Budget Advisory Committee. Are you talking? Let me pull up the bag charter and I'll sure. share it with everybody. Let's. Bear with me, I'm almost there. I found the event at the library that UG Cam sent out who was asking for it, the research on tap event. Yeah. Oh, I was asking that it be sent to Ben and De Paula. Okay. Okay, I'll do that right now. Thanks, Christina. Mm -hmm. Super. Sorry, I thought I had this right at hand. Give me a second. Jeez, what is Mary, can you pull that up? Do you have give you your email open or now? Um, yeah, hold on. I gotta move a little 
move something around here. Um, it is in your email to me of 9.39 a.m. yesterday. Let me find this another way. Nine thirty nine Wednesday. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Okay. All right. Let me share my screen, and I'll show you the charter here. Up, oh, I can't. Christina, can you allow me to share my screen? I don't seem to be able to. There we go. Okay. All right. Can everybody see what I say? Yeah. Okay. So then um, the UG Glenn Common Area Budget Advisory Committee. Is that the bag? Uh, that's the CAG. Uh, uh, budget Advisory. Uh, yeah, I guess you're right. It is strangely worded, but yeah. Bag would be the budget advisory committee or budget advisory group. Okay, and then who's the UGCAC? I assume that was a predecessor to the um, I would assume that that's the that's the CAG. Isn't that our group? Yeah. Well, we're the CAG. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, so I think this is the CAG here. Whoops. This is the CAG here, okay. and I think this is the BAG here, and it says committee, but I assume it was, you know, just a change in nomenclature. Okay. Well, I mean, that's why I'm asking. Um, and then you see UGCAC at the end of that paragraph. I. That's a good question. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. Okay. What, what's what's the, what's the what's uh, I mean? What do you? I'm trying to figure out where we're where we're trying to get to with this. We're trying to get the, to who's on first. So I think the 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 bag is designed to. Now, John, John, provide. work with me here. <laughs> I just I'm just trying to figure out: is there an entity called the UGCAC? If so. You know, I don't know the history, so there could have okay. been, and it might be a change, but I don't, right. I, I'm not certain. Okay. And then, okay. So then we've got the budget advisory committee, which you tell me is really the budget advisory group, the BAG, serves that as. seems logical, right? Well, hold on. That second line there in the second paragraph has it in a whole new entity described. Right. Exactly. The University Glen Advisory Council. Never been mentioned before. Which serves uh, as the site authority interface to the UG community. Um, so I'm not. I mean, I think the intent seems pretty clear to me that the site authority is looking for input from the community to develop an annual operating budget, a CAM budget. Does anybody dispute that that seems to be the, the, the intent of the document? Well, I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm not challenging it. I'm just trying to get, and it may need, mean, John, that you need to, you know, send it back to legal and have somebody sit and go through it line by line and get the language consistent so we know you know, who's talking about what, because it looks yeah. like a typo in what's, you know, different, right? Yeah, I, I, I think I, I, it's, nobody's opposed to the bag, right? They want to have input as to what the, the CAM right. I'm not budget challenging is. That. Yeah. So yeah. I think it, it, uh, my guess is, Mary, is that UGCAG and University of Glen Common Area Budget Committees was our budget advisory committee were terms that were used in the past to denote the bag and the CAG um, and the HAC. And it's just that those terms have changed over time, much like 
University of Glenn does corporation doesn't exist. It was replaced, obviously, by UAS and site authority. So I suspect that's it. Is there a possibility to get a clean version of what is actually represented now? Because there's two entities in here, and I agree with Mary, that we have no idea what they are. Is it, was yeah, it a simple I mean, typo or is I, it? I don't know. I don't know if it's just a term. Those, those committees existed in the past and they've been replaced by subsequent committees or the names changed much like, you know, UGC doesn't exist anymore. It was changed. So um, if, if, if there was interest in just cleaning up the entities identified, I think that there's, I'm, I'm certainly open to that. I can't imagine would, would, the HAC would be supportive of that too. Am I right, Mary? Um, I suspect it would, but we've got a brand new HAC starting next week. And so I'm not going to speak um, for them. Yeah, I, I, and Ben, I'm imagining if you wanted to clean up, you know, what are the sort of the source entities or the founding entities that, that Kennedy Wilson uh, multifamily, or Kennedy Wilson, yeah, multifamily, wouldn't object to clarify, like cleaning it up and not, Changing the intent, just making yeah, sure it's that, correct. Yeah. John, you have our you have our support because I think to uh -huh. your point, I think this is you know I think the intent is clear. I think this is just you know whether by mistake or whether over time evolution of the namesake of the respective groups. Well, I've had two different calls members. about it today, which is why I'm raising it. Okay, so yeah, uh, I, I can't imagine that anybody's going to want to have less input into the camp budget no, development. No, no, of course not. So, it's not about you know, the process. Mary, Mary, yeah, Mary, why don't you talk to the HAC and if there's an interest in, in cleaning the document up and making sure that all of the entities cited currently exist. Um, I'm open to it. Ben's open to it. I think we could get this over the finish line pretty quickly. Put a okay. date on it. Yeah, put, and put a date on it. Put a date on and it. Put it on letterhead. Okay. It's on letterhead. Yeah. That's but one I think step. And John, I, I think the, it, and I haven't talked to Mary about this, this, is just my own thinking off the top of my head after living here for 21 years. It's these little things that end up making a big difference in trust. And that's not, on, do that's it. not on anybody on this call, but it's when you find these little things that are just like you pull a string and it's like, well, this doesn't make any sense. Why did this happen? So I think cleaning it up is a great way to, to move forward and make sure the intent is there. Let's do it. Okay. And then I, I assume that there's no um, difference in the, um, the last sentence of the first paragraph. The committee is not a decision-making body. That's correct. Yeah. The only person who can approve the TM budget is the site authority board. Having said that, in that letter that was sent out in response to the community, it was made clear that the site authority doesn't want to second guess the decisions that are made by the community as long as they, you know, satisfy the terms of the sublease and, um, and, you know, maintain the, the, the mission of the, of the community. Okay. Um, why don't, why doesn't UG cam just go and go through it and edit it and send it back? Because obviously we, we were around when some of this happened. And so um, we can do it in our office for both the, the bag and the CAG. Yeah, that'd be great. Craft a draft document. And then we could just circulate it you know, to yeah. HAC, to Ben and his team and let people redline it. Yeah. And then we'll have a finalized document that everybody can agree yeah. on. Yeah, we'll do that. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. You bet. You're welcome. Helpful. Uh, and I think everything else I had has been covered today. So I'm done. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Just got to stop sharing screen here. I uploaded the response letter that has the letterhead and signed to the owner resources page under miscellaneous. Beautiful. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you for it. I somehow lost the ability to stop sharing screen, but- Oh, here, I'll do it. Stop there you okay. go. Thanks. Okay. Um, anybody have anything else before we wrap okay. up the meeting? All right. Thanks, everybody. Mary, I'll see you in an hour or so at uh, HAC. And thanks, everybody, for participating. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.